<laughs> it's so engaging though, isn't it? It, it oh. does feel exhausting just having watched it. It felt exhilarating. It was like, you know, back and forth, back and forth, chances, challenges, there was a lot of drama, you know, penalties, this and that. It was just a brilliant game for all to see. It's going to be a roller coaster ride. Buckle up like my blazer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sky's going to be a lot of games. Buckle up, baby. Buckle up. <laughs> roller coaster ride to go. Can't uh, wait for the, for, for the season to, to end on, on a bang. It's going to be brilliant. We've still got another 10 games for each side. Another 30 points still to play for. We shouldn't forget that. And there have been some really significant games uh, up and down the Premier League today. Not least in our first game of this uh, Super Sunday. Uh, because this is how it uh, finished up with uh, Man U winning 2-0 against Everton yesterday in the early start. 2-2 uh, two -two between Bournemouth and Sheffield United. Crystal Palace held by a late, late equaliser from Corley Woodrow, almost 10 years after his first Premier League goal. Wolves getting the job done against Fulham. Arsenal right at the end and through Kai Havertz seeing off Brentford to go top. And then earlier today, Spurs putting four past Villa without reply in the second half. John McGinn sent off with the score at 2-0, but Ange Postacoglu's biggest win as Spurs boss. Brighton having lost 4-0 in Rome, bounced back with a 1-0 victory over Forest, who are desperate for points themselves right now. They go to Luton, who are three points behind them next Saturday. West Ham coming from two down to draw 2-2 with Burnley. Danny Ings with the equaliser late on his first goal for over a year. You can see them all by scanning the QR code. It will take you straight to the weekend's goals on the Sky Sports app. So this is how it leaves us. Sheffield United back on bottom. Uh, then come Burnley, Luton on 21 points, three above them, Forest. Now Luton go to Bournemouth as well on Wednesday night for that rearranged game. There is a chance they'll be out of the bottom three before they take on Forest next Saturday. Then come Everton, who just can't find a win from anywhere right now. Brentford, it's the same story. Then a bit of a gap to Crystal Palace, and you're looking comfortable if you're Bournemouth and Fulham. Chelsea, top of the bottom. And Newcastle, bottom of the top. Then come Wolves. They've had a, a really good few weeks. European football, still a possibility for them. A much needed victory for Brighton and Roberto De Zerbi today. A West Ham, though, still in seventh. Then come Manchester United. Spurs have opened up that six point gap, and they are two now behind Aston Villa with that game in hand. And then into the top three. One point between those top three sides with just 10 games left in the season. We have a brilliant finish ahead, but it's Manchester City, then Liverpool and Arsenal in front on goal difference. The master and the apprentice. How would you sum them up, their performances today? Brilliant. And I think I said on the pitch before the game, I think the, the great centre-backs, if you just even look at the Premier League area, you think of, sort of Tony Adams, John Terry, these type of figures for their clubs, and that's what Virgil van Dijk is for Liverpool. The great centre-backs don't just play their own game. You can control a whole back four. Now, when you look at Liverpool's back four coming into the game, everyone in the stadium is thinking, oh, you're not bringing to Manchester City, it's De Bruyne, it's Haaland. But even though Kwanzaa was outstanding, brilliant, he can concentrate on his own game. That's, that's enough for him because of who he's up against and he's such a young player. But the greats look after you at the back and that's why Virgil van Dijk was man of the match. And I, I was speaking to the lads when the game was going on. He's up against Haaland as well. Haaland's the best centre forward in the world. For me, Virgil van Dijk is right up there in terms of centre-back. And I made a comment to them, I don't know if people might agree, but I actually think Virgil van Dijk's a better centre-back than Erlen Haaland as a striker. That's how highly I rate Virgil van Dijk. I think he's absolutely outstanding. And if you're thinking about the battle of, of one of the best at the back, maybe the best centre-back, be the best centre-forward, Virgil van Dijk came out, out on top. There were a lot of eyebrows raised, not least in here, when the team news came through today. Did the level of Liverpool's performance surprise you a little bit, Daniel? Do you think, actually, it was a better point for them in these circumstances? I think the, the performance surprised everybody. I think there was, there was an expectation of, of Manchester City looking at the team sheets that they'd come in and there'd be a better side today. But I think for me, Liverpool in the, in the first half, of course, they weren't at the level that they would have liked to have been. They grew into the game as the game went on and the tide changed. As soon as that penalty happened, they, they thought to themselves, you know what, we can get out here now, we can get them. We've got the confidence in our, in our, in our team. 
we've got the belief, we, we know that we have the players. And I think when, you know, Diaz had some moments there. But I think overall, I think they'd be happy. You know, if you asked them before the game, hey, would you take a draw, given the injuries they've got, given the, the team that's on the football pitch, would you take it? I think Jurgen would have said yes, to be honest. Of course, we, we wanted, they would have wanted to win, but they'd be happy with the draw. Well, let's start our analysis by looking at the John Stones goal from that set piece. And, Michael, it looks so simple. It looks like a, a tap-in, but clearly it's, there's a lot more to it than that. Tell yeah, us. they said the, uh, the work on it yesterday in training, but it's, it's more about the ball for me than anything. If you look at De Bruyne, to get that amount of pace and whip at, at that part, just as the run here, we'll look at the, the run from Stones after and the block. You see Ake here with McAllister just nudges him out of the way and he just times his run to perfection. But to De Bruyne, to get the accuracy at there, it looks like the ball's going to go out, just bends it across and it was a wonderful finish. You know, you see even defenders in that area before fluffed the lines, but just a lovely cushioned finish and the confidence was sky high at this point. Uh, there was a suggestion on, on commentary that it was a foul, the, the blocking at the near post. What did you think? Absolutely not. No, that's the game. You listen to games physically. You got you'd be disappointed. You got you, you want players to be stronger in there, but it's smart play by City, obviously. Suggesting that they spotted a weakness in Liverpool. Yeah, in that they, area. they would have done. Obviously, these uh, the guys who set up the set piece or whatever, they're, they're looking at opposition all the time, constantly looking at different set pieces, of course. We know the importance. We saw two set pieces today, but you've got to execute it. And for a player to play that ball, they would have looked at obviously they would have practiced it, but can you do it in with the pressure on? And players like De Bruyne. A nice moment for him. Is it, as well, pleased, but of course, it's probably a little bonus for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the equaliser. We talked beforehand about the, the importance of the pace of Darwin Nunez. Did we see it here in this foot race with Edison? Yeah, I'm just glad he wasn't offside. We can't be off a back pass, <laughs> can you? Uh, but no, listen, listen it's just a, a moment of madness from the goalkeeper, really. I mean, good, fair play to me, reads it from Aki, but. He just comes flying across and... He's all or nothing, doesn't he, Jamie? When, yeah. He, he gets it, he, when he gets it right, obviously, it's fantastic. But when he gets it wrong, uh, the downside with the goal is, but is his injury. That's a big blow if he's badly injured. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll get me some news on that. But uh, hopefully, for City's sake, it's not too much of a serious one. Yeah, I mean, he has these moments now and again in, in different situations. He can come flying out and get himself involved in certain things. And, you know, we talk about sort of goalkeepers not being involved that much. Well, probably with Manchester City. Probably the, the position of any goalkeeper in world football is not involved as much. They have so much of the ball. So now and again, you can see that from... There was, there was a pause at that point. There was the, obviously the treatment for Edison, who, who carried on at that point. And also it looked like Virgil van Dijk was questioning whether he should be sent off. Um, of course, he couldn't because if it's judged that Edison is trying to play the ball, then it's uh, a yellow card is the maximum punishment. You're happy with that, Daniel? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, when we're talking about Darwin here, I think the goalkeeper probably underestimates how fast he actually is. To have that, that pace and power to be able to get to the ball and just nudge it in front of him. Look, he's tried to play the ball. He's obviously kicked the player, so I think the referee got, did the right decision there. So then Alexis McAllister has three and a half minutes after this incident to think about what he's going to do. <laughs> Should we actually credit him for yeah, maintaining his yeah. poise yeah. in those circumstances. Yeah. You don't want to be waiting too long on such a big occasion, um, but his technique has to hit the kind of base of the side net. It's a good effort from the goalkeeper, but beautiful, calm, cool, great execution. Look at that. Brilliant. Enough pace on it. He, he took one midweek for Liverpool in, the, in Europe, in the Europa League, but I, I've just come to me then, he took one against Man United. Was it the last kick of the game? It was, in the last season, I think he took one to beat Man United. Uh, I think it was maybe there was other time he was actually waiting for them. So he's, he's used to these pressure situations, and I thought he was brilliant today. You know, to talk about him maybe making a slow start when he first came in. I thought the partnership with him and, and Endo in midfield today was fantastic. How much are we going to miss him? Oh, huge. Great interview there, obviously. He's obviously proud of his team, and rightly so, with the quality they showed in the second half. They had great chances, but he's been a great personality for the game. Really has. Pretty honest in all his views. I love his interviews. Players obviously love playing for him. Liverpool fans obviously love him. The quality, the type of football his teams play. And you can see there, for again, for all his achievements in the game, he's still, the performance today, he's very proud. And he's right, particularly the second half. They showed great quality, dominated City, particularly midfield. Had great chances, didn't take them, but still a brilliant performance.
I'm, I'm not quite sure we've seen him that effusive after a draw before, Daniel. I just think he was excited and very proud of his team. And, <coughs> you know, I think when you analyse what he's achieved at this football club and looking at the team he put out there today, there were a lot of doubts from the outside. So he probably feels as if he's proven people wrong. He talked about Kwanzaa coming in and, you know, Haaland and a lot of players. He mentioned so many players. He's just a huge amount of pride in how his team's performed on the big stage with the expectation that they're probably going to lose today. They performed exceptionally. I'm just wondering if anyone didn't get a mention from him there. You're in trouble. He the bus, did he? Yeah, no. Yeah, Gareth Southgate needs to pick Joe Gomez for a start. He said it was the best second half performance ever against Manchester City. Luis Diaz was right at the heart of it, Daniel. So talk us through three great moments within five minutes, which, which could have separated these sides ultimately. Yeah, I think Luis Diaz today was, he, he did everything besides score. I think this one, the touch obviously wasn't good enough, um, but the tenacious elements of his game are always there. He's always willing to, to run with the ball, but as you say, the touch there just wasn't, wasn't right. And I think this chance was the best one of the, of the lot for me. Brilliant Running ball. through here, he's got all of the goal. He's looking at the goalkeeper. He's analysing him. He's running at a very fast speed. You're thinking, open what your body out. What should he be thinking about here? Open then? your body out and just slide it home. We've talked about the likes of Thierry, the likes of so many different players around the world running through in these moments and being calm and collected in front of goal. And he just got it wrong. And you're thinking with this one, maybe a first time finish. It was slightly behind him a little bit, but you want him to take a shot at least. And that, that was, for me, I'm thinking he did everything today but score. He performed very well, but those moments you have to take him in. The and a games. great moment as well for Darwin Nunez. Andy Robertson comes on the pitch, this quality of delivery. Yeah, goodness gracious me, Robbo, what a ball this is. And Darwin gets, a, it's like he got his studs on it. He got his studs on the ball. You can't really guide these into the back of the net. It's about getting something on it and let the keeper do his job. The keeper's done his job. You give him credit. Really good save from Stefan Ortega. Right, Jurgen Klopp was questioning the penalty. We've got four people here, maybe a couple with Liverpool persuasion, one from Manchester City in neutral. Does anybody think Impartial. it was a penalty? Impartial. Come on, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> anybody think penalty? I think he makes a good point about his, he gets the ball, but his foot is so high. I don't think mm. there was any force behind it. So I, I think the officials got it right. But a lucky I actually, boy. I actually think he's... He, he sees McAllister coming, he's almost trying to pull his foot away. And so, I mean, he can be... I think if that's given on the pitch, it's not getting overturned. But I think once it's not given, he doesn't fully go right through with it. And what Jürgen Klopp said was anywhere else on the pitch, that'd be a foul. Well, that was Jürgen I, Klopp's argument. No, no but I, I almost... Think, I agree with that, but I, I do think there's almost like an unwritten rule in football. There's something... With a penalty, it's got it just. Bit more. If we, it, yeah, I think we we all know it. When it's in the box, it has to be a little bit more. He's lucky, but I can see why they haven't given. Were you worried at that moment? Of course, I was worried. I, I just thought it was naive. If you actually look at Doku, we could have headed it. He was under the table at that stage. Why don't you just header it out? Why you want your foot up there in the last minutes of the game? Like, it's gonna cause that sort of drama. But I probably agree with Kara. I think yeah, if it was given. It was, it's not a return. He was not... He, 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 he sort of as he touched go. it, it's almost like he's trying to pull his, pull his foot, foot back, back rather than... Yeah. And that probably just saved him. It, it does feel like when, when these two teams meet, there is an intensity about these matches. I don't know if it's because of the managers, where they will continue post clock but there's something special. Yeah, because they're both top managers. I think when you come up against Klopp's side, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get energy, you're going to get quality, and they've pushed them for the league. You know, they've got to the Champions League, what, three out of the, the five seasons at Liverpool. They're, they're a good side, you know, that's to be expected, but I think it was a little bit frustrated when people talk about the record here at He's Anfield. bored of talking about Anfield, Yeah, because he? the record at, at Etihad is, is, is very good, but... It's a mutual respect they got for each other. They both know the top managers, both looked after two top teams, and it's just great for, for us to watch, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. Uh, we will miss these epic battles, that is for sure. Whoever comes in, we will be uh, discussing that, potentially, in the uh, weeks and months ahead. City also had their chances to win it. We shouldn't forget that. Um, let's have a look at some of those moments, Daniel. Yeah, First think... of all, for Phil Foden. Yeah, for Foden... For me, I think Foden t today in the first half particularly was, was really good. He, showed, he had some very good moments and he's on great form. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, could he lift it? 
Can he get it through the keeper's legs? He got the ball on target. He was on his weaker foot. The touch managed to bounce for him. And, yeah. Does he really want that touch to go across, Daniel, there? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think he's, he's done everything he probably could. But for, for Kelleher to, to make sure that he doesn't allow him to put the ball through his legs, if you see there, it was kind of like it, his legs sort of went in diagonally to stop the ball. And in those positions, typically, a, an attacker would put the ball through the goalkeeper's legs. You see here how he's, he sort of slides and it's, he blocks it from going between his legs. That's one of the finishes in the box that typically would go in. So Keller, Keller did very well there. Big moment for Keller, isn't it, that? It is, he's been brilliant. And we also talk about Alisson coming out on top of someone when he's there. He's obviously worked with him every day and that's what he's been brilliant at since he's come back in the team. But in terms of folding, I think a couple of years ago, the opposite side of that box at the cop end, he scored with his left foot in off the post. I think that made it 2-2. And City ended up winning the league by a point. Mm. You know, so you realise how big these games are. We, we don't know. Are Liverpool going to look back at the chances they had with Diaz and think, you know, if they lose the league by a point here, you know, that's why they've been so pivotal these games and that's why they, you know, continue to entertain us. And I think a lot of people thought that City had won it. Julian Alvarez started for City on that left-hand side. Then we saw Doku coming into the fray. And Mike, and we just wondered if he might have a say in this contest, and he so nearly did. Yeah, well, Liverpool's structure was, was so good. He rarely got a one versus one You see Harvey Elliott coming across. And just as he hit it, we think it's going to nestle into the net, just off that post. Just takes a touch here. Hits it, and he just think maybe... But no, it wasn't meant to be. He offered a little bit of threat down there, give the ball away a couple of times, but you expect that one-on-one, -on -one, that's his job to do. Yeah, we're giving a lot of praise to Liverpool and they were direction in the second half, but City also showed why they're champions. You have to dig in. You, know, you can't play well every week and the expectations of Man City now is very high. But the second half, as well as Liverpool played, City have shown why they're great champions. They dug in and got a big point. And what did you make of the De Bruyne substitution? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's good. I think it was, I think it was the right decision. I think he was just off a little bit. Listen, Pep's the manager. He's got to look at the bigger picture. Kevin's a, obviously what we can't praise him. Not a world-class player. He was disappointed. Pep's gone off to give him a little bit of pep talk. <laughs> 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 but I, I love to be answered after. Listen, he can show me the next time how disappointed he is. Listen, nobody likes to be brought off. But Pep's job is to look at the bigger picture, try and get a right result for his team, and they'll recover from that, no doubt. Uh, bad news for everyone else, because he says that De Bruyne is going to prove himself <laughs> in the next game. Uh, right, let's have a reminder of where that leaves us. And we said repeatedly, it's never been this, time, this stage of the season. Three teams at the top separated by just one point. Take my word for it. Arsenal leading the way with uh, Liverpool and Manchester City close behind. Only goal difference separating the top two right now. And remember that uh, Arsenal not in FA Cup action next week. They... Uh, in their next Premier League duty is against Manchester City at the Etihad. So another epic game we have to look forward to. Are we um, thinking any differently after 90 minutes here, Jamie? No, I mean, I think if you're Arsenal you're watching today and you think the perfect result is a draw, and I think Liverpool will be looking next week and think, you know, the, the great uh, result will be a draw. But I, I think from Liverpool or Arsenal's point of view, they're, they're trying to chase down City. They're, they're the team to beat still, I would say. And I think City have dropped points here. And City's next sort of four or five games feel like if they're going to drop points, they're going to be them. So even though Arsenal are top, I think from a Liverpool point of view, I think I prefer to see Arsenal win there or, or it be a draw. Certainly not a City win. Because I, I think City's last five or six games of the season, you'd look at them and think, you'd think they get maximum points. If they're not going to lose points in the next sort of three, four games... I think it'll be tough to stop. What are we getting here? Uh, right, we're going to see all the fixtures for everybody. So Jamie's uh, talking about the next couple for, for Manchester City, being Arsenal and uh, Aston Villa at home. And then, yeah, maybe a, a, a lighter finish. At this stage, Arsenal have a 19% chance of winning the title, according to Opta. And that's mm -hmm. based, I suppose, on, on how they think they will do, do in those individual games. They, they calculate it for all the teams. Would you give them more chance than that, Daniel? I do, yeah. I, I, I don't know, you know, the stats are the stats, I suppose, Opta is giving us. But Arsenal have been brilliant and they've, they've shown their capabilities. They've shown that, you know, last night, when you score a late goal like that, they're building something. Last season they were brilliant. This season they're improving again. So I think they're all within, within their rights to believe they can do this. I think Arsenal have a, have a great chance of winning the title, but 
like Jamie said, City are the team to beat. They've shown over the years, they're the team to beat. Liverpool have performed very well this season, probably over expectations at the start of the season. We didn't think we'd be in this position now saying Liverpool are fighting for the title. So for them, they're, they're pushing as well. I, we can look at those fixtures, but it's what's in between them in terms of Champions League. Liverpool playing Thursday night. If Liverpool and City get to the FA Cup semi-final, let's say they meet each other in that semi-final, what that takes out here physically, you know, psychologically at that time of the season, then a league game has to get put in, in between you know, so one of those fixtures. So you play three league games in a week. So, I mean, from if I'm Arsenal, I'll be thinking, I hope City and Liverpool keep going in the FA Cup, maybe meet each other. From a Liverpool point of view, I'm hoping City and Arsenal meet each other in the quarter-final of the Champions League because of, I think when you play an English team in Europe, it, there's something extra about it, you know, build-up and what it takes out here. Yeah, we did it so often against Chelsea when I was playing. So, I think there's so much more than just what we're looking at there in terms of the fixtures. Who wins it from here, Micah? I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, isn't it? I gave Arsenal the big build-up last year. I thought they would do it last year. Sort of fell off towards the end of last season. This season, I just think City. I just, I think if City would have lost today, I would have said Arsenal, but because City have come Arsenal. Here, if Liverpool would have won. Yeah, I, I thought, I thought the, the momentum that was on. Yeah, I would have said Arsenal. Ooh. Yeah. You're an Arsenal but because, fan, aren't you? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I, honestly, I can't call it. Last year, I never had any doubt that um, City would would eventually win it. Uh, I think you were quite strong on City. Uh, go back a few weeks, you were probably quite strong on City. Yeah, Are you? Not a, a doubt that a little so, bit. A little bit. I'm not betting against them, but I look what Liverpool today. Their the performance. Everything you watch Liverpool, they're creating chances, scoring goals. I look at Arsenal now, physically compared to last year, Arsenal looks such a much stronger team, so I don't think they'll fade on that side of it. And will they have learnt from oh, that? Of course before? they would have, yeah. And the, the recruitment, you know, the players they've brought in have added strength to them, have added quality, and it's just that physical side of it. And I look at Arsenal and that mindset, they look, they look, they look ready for the challenge. So I'm, um, uh, I don't know who to, who to go with this year. I, I think if City beat Arsenal, I think they'd be really strong favourites. I do think that. Uh, I think if Arsenal go there and get something, it, it, we're having the same conversation. It's almost up in the air. I, I do feel like Arsenal and Liverpool would need a three or four point gap going into the last sort of five or six games of the season if they were to, to top City. The build up starts now to Manchester City against Arsenal. Are you doing that game? Another great game. <laughs> <laughs> Easter Sunday. <laughs> He's a few shots, isn't he, late doors? Are you in, are you? Yeah, I'm already comfortable. Selected. Squad <laughs> <laughs> rotation. There's a lot can happen between now and then, Mike. <laughs> Biggest home defeat for Aston Villa under Unai Emery. Biggest victory for Spurs under Ange Postacoglu. All four goals in the second half. How impressive were they, Daniel? They were, they were very impressive. I think the way in which they, they started the game was, was very good. But then when, once they started creating chances and, you know, they were lethal. They weren't messing about with, in front of goal. You know, once the ball, I think this was the absolutely magnificent cross from Saar, finish from Madison was brilliant. Um, but yeah, they, they were lethal in front of goal today. That was his first goal for five months, make him feel much better. Brennan Johnson's been uh, an interesting addition as well this season. Couple of assists from the bench, got his uh, start today, Micah, and justified it, would you say? Yeah, I think he did, definitely. Uh, like I said, got a couple of assists last week and he was ready for it. Um, but this is my mate, John McGinn. I mean, just frustration for the game. I think he knows it's a red card. Right decision was made. Um, yeah, he could just see he grew into it. Could be a costly one, that, though, couldn't it? Definitely, yeah, because he's been so key for them this season. But when you see it back, it's not great at all. Yeah. And Sean? Well, Roy was calling, Jamie, for, for Spurs to be ruthless in these moments. Yeah with Villa down to 10, that goal difference could be a factor. Yeah, yeah. listen, it could play a factor. We're looking at the top of the league, but in terms of what Arsenal did, Sheffield United a few days ago, but mm -hmm. as I said, in terms of qualifying for the Champions League, whether it's top four, top five, we're not quite sure yet. But when you think of the swing, eight goal swing, you know, with Aston Villa. Eight goal swing and the goal difference in one yeah, game. Yeah, it could be absolutely huge. How yeah. significant do you think it is? Yeah, you know, huge. Again, I think with that confidence, that momentum, you get players coming off the bench, scoring goals, the feel-good factor, the usual stuff that goes into winning games of football, uh, setback for Villa, a yeah, big result for them. Where does it leave Manchester United now? Um, I'm not sure really, because we're talking about top four, top five. I think for United, the, the main thing for United is to be consistent and keep winning football matches and hope they slip up, obviously. So, 
you know, um, if obviously that fifth place is available, I think it's a bit of a stretch to catch Villa for fourth. They have to keep their heads on and keep winning football matches. Can, can Villa regroup, Micah? Yeah, definitely they can regroup. I think they've been excellent this season. I think they had a few dodgy results, but what Emery's doing there, the way the structure and the way Watkins has been, he was a little bit off it in terms of the chances created today, but they'll bounce back for sure. He had to feed on scraps, though, didn't he? In this, in this different tweak to the formation, particularly at home, you haven't seen that from Mooney Emery before with a back five. Yeah, but I think you have to adjust to who you're playing. You know Spurs are good down the wings, and especially on Doggy and Porro wing backs, they, they like to get forward, so you have to adjust. Didn't quite work today, although it worked in half, up until half time. It's just in the second half. But you know what it looked like, Mike? It, sometimes you look at these games and it does look like that European game has mm. an effect on them. It does. It just it does, looks yeah. 5 10% off, and that's enough to cause a bad result.